So, John, talk, talk about you, uh, your parents and how they um, uh, helped you with your educational development and helped you with, uh, with your physical development. You know, my dad would just literally say to us that, you know, I don't care what you do, but you have to do something. So it was a, it was a requirement that we, that, we, that we did something. So as far as physical, it was, uh, it was just a requirement for us to, to be active. It was a non-negotiable it wasn't a, it wasn't a, well, you know, you really should. It's like, you know, you're going to do something. Um, <clears throat> as when you say to, we, how many brothers and sisters? Just one brother. Uh, okay. I got one, one brother, uh, a year and four months older than me. And uh, from an education, I think it was more environment. So I was born in Compton, California. Uh, my hospital was a hospital called Killer King. Not a, not a good nickname for a hospital. But uh, that's, that's where I was born. And my dad got a job at a company called Steelcase and moved us out, you know, moved us out of the area, moved us into Orange County, California, which is very nice. You know, the, the slogan for your Belinda is the land of gracious living. Right. So I think the impact that he had on the impact that he uh, really had on our education and, and development started with the environment. So one of the, one of my six keys is if your environment doesn't support your goals, you need a new environment. And so he, lost all of his friends, went way out, of his, way out of his comfort zone for me to be, for us to be in a better school district, for us to have better influences, kids that were going to these great schools and doing all these great, great things. And, you know, they were all more, you know, they were all super successful from these super successful families. And so you start to see that and you go, okay, gosh, like, how do I do that? For me, for me, it's kind of sounds silly, but it's true. I, I remember going to a friend's house and they had a pool in their backyard. And I was just like, <laughs> Like they have a pool in their backyard. That's crazy. That's what, and I, I said right then and there, I'm going to find out how I can do that. Like what it takes to do that. I will have a pool in my backyard, period. hundred percent it's happening. And uh, so, and yes, I do have a 23,000 gallon saltwater pool in the back. You know, it's a standard now, but it's the energy that that releases, right? The, you know, the energy, you know, my, my, uh, my cousin, and I spent a couple of years filming a documentary uh, called The Dark Dollar. And I juxtaposed my life and my cousin's life for a, you know, a large part of that. And we were born in the same, same hospital, same, same place. But he didn't leave. And I did. And when I was in middle school, I sold caramel apple pops and mini Snickers. And he sold weed. What's the difference between those, those two, right? I was, I was hustling and making money. He was hustling and making money. I was learning supply, demand, distribution, scale. He was learning supply, demand, distribution, scale. Right. But there's a difference in, in, in the end result and the end product. So sorry for the long winded answer. <laughs> so uh, let's go back to your definition of energy. When did you first think about um, that definition? When, how, how did, uh, did you become aware that we are ruled by energy? Ooh, that's a, that's a good one. For me, it was, I had a kind of a unique upbringing. So I think I, or at least a unique experience growing up. So I think uh, I caught that early, at least at, uh, at starting with the age of 10, I would say like a real, that was kind of a real thing for me. I was, uh, when I was a kid, I had a severe stutter. I mean, so bad that you, you could barely string two words together. Right. So, you know, here I am seven years old with this severe stutter and inside in my head, though, I was charming. I had things to say. I wanted to say them, and it just never worked out. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Fast forward to my 10th birthday party, and it was a, it was a pool party. And uh, the kids, the kids, uh, you know, kids can be cruel, you know. And we were playing Marco Polo, and I was there with my eyes closed, and I was stuttering, and I was, you know, Mama Marco and the kids, you know, gave me that, gave me that, uh, you know, that teasing that normally kids would. And that was my breaking point. Uh, so after that, I went to speech therapy, which I had been going for years. I went to speech therapy and talked to the PhD speech, speech pathologist and said, hey, we've got we've to gotta, we've gotta stop this. Like, I can't continue to stutter. And they said to me, very comforting, very comforting, came up with their arm on my back and said, you know, John, it's, it's possible that you're going to stutter for the rest of your life. And we're going to give you the tips and the pointers and things to to, to cope with this, you know, we're going to, we're going to help you. And I think that was the moment for me to understand, you know, what energy, 
like what energy is and like the nuance of it as well. Cause although that they were, although they were comforting and although they were, had a, you know, they were, have, had a positive, uh, you know, positive thing, the actual things that they were saying was detrimental, was detrimental to my future. You know what I mean? Like this limiting belief that they were trying to sell to me that I'm going to stutter for the rest of my life. That, I, that, that belief would have taken my life on a way different trajectory, way different. So had I believed that, had I took that energy and ran with that, Everything would have been, I would, there was, there was none of this I would have done. I'm not even sure I'd be alive. I mean, who knows, right? And so at that moment, I, I quit speech therapy and I just had to ask a really powerful question. I was like, how, like, how do I, how do I solve this problem? I didn't know. I didn't have a clue. So I said, okay, well, what do I know? What can I do? What can I do and not stutter? Ah, I recognized three things. One thing was when I rapped or sang, I didn't stutter. So I'd go around the house and I would be rapping and singing everything, making up songs. Can I have a sandwich? Who drank all the Kool-Aid? Roger stopped bothering me. That was my brother. And so you would just go do that and sing those songs. Second thing I recognized is when I would mimic the nightly news anchor, I didn't stutter. So VHS, I'd go and I'd record it every night and I'd put it, I'd take it in my room and I would just copy them. A house fire killed seven in Pacoima County. James has the story, James. Back to you about all, all that, all every single night and then the third thing that i recognized was when i would visualize myself in my in my mind i didn't stutter in my head so i would read books uh doesn't matter what book i would just read it and i would imagine myself on stage delivering it to a crowd my my timing was perfect my inflection was perfect all that was perfect and so i did these three things over and over and over again consistently and about 11 months later so no progress, no progress whatsoever. 11 months later, then we started seeing some progress. Had my first sentence. I spoke it to my grandfather without stuttering. It's like, oh, I felt it. I knew it. I was like, ooh, I got a whole sentence out. And then it was, and then it was 30 seconds. Then it was a minute. And then it was the like first day, which was a few days before my birthday, a year later. First day. I was like, whoa, I didn't stutter the whole day. Whoa. And so I really I understood this whole energy of like progress. And so I'm still making progress. I can go years without, without a stutter now. So we're, just, we're still working it out. <laughs> but I think, I think that's, that's probably it. It's probably the first time that uh, you, know, you had to make that real, that real like visceral uh, you know, discernment of, of what somebody says and how they say it. You know, uh, it's, uh, it's the Cobra effect. Everybody should be mindful of the Cobra effect if you're not familiar. You know, if you, leave, if you take one thing away from, from this, um, at least from me speaking, uh, it's the Cobra effect. Is everybody familiar with what that is? I'm curious now. Has, okay, this is fun. Okay, I'm watching. I'm seeing the squares here. Is anybody, by show of hands, if you heard the story, do you know where that even comes from? Somebody wave at me if you got it. Oh, yes. No, no one. Cool. And if I can't see your video, it doesn't count, even if you know the story. Okay. So here's, the, here's a quick one. <clears throat> so years ago in New Delhi, India, there was an infestation of cobras. And so the government in their infinite wisdom said, okay, citizens of New Delhi, if you bring us, if you bring us dead cobras, we will pay you. We'll pay you a bounty for dead cobras. Now, a little bit of crowd participation here. What do you think happened as a result? What do you think happened? Without looking it up, nothing like that, what do you think happened? A lot of people got bit by cobras. Okay, okay. A lot of people got bit by cobras, okay. Cool, good guess. If you grow up, if if you grew up poor, you might get this answer correct. Twenty-four hour hunting going on for cobras. Wait, say it again, Jerome. Twenty-four hour hunting going on for cobras. Okay, they're they're hunting. Okay, you probably. I don't know if you grew up broke. Broke. We're gonna find out. Okay, let's. Okay, what we got? Breathing. What they kept Who said breathing. it? There breathing. you go. Cobras. That's it. They started breeding cobras. <laughs> they started breeding cobras. That's what, that's what happened, right? So if you grew up in the hood, you get that quick. They're like, oh, you're going to pay me for, watch, <laughs> hold my beer, it, done. So they started breeding cobras, right? So everybody in New Delhi, they're like, great, government's paying us for these dead cobras. So they breed them and then they kill them and they give them to the government. And the government gives them money. So a couple of years later, the government, they're looking at their numbers. They're like, uh, uh, this is, they're going in the wrong direction. So let's kill the program. Well, they killed the program and 
after they killed the program, they said, okay, no more. We're not going to pay you anymore for Cobras. And then they all released them into the wild. And net net, you had more, you had exponentially more Cobras after that than you did before. So that is an effect that that is the Cobra effect. So what does that have to do with us? What does that have to do with your progress? What does that have to do with your development as a person? Well, think, take, take stock in all of the things around you. Take stock in some of, and, and, and a lot of times, again, it could be family members. So oftentimes it is, significant others, uh, friends, peers, things like that. If you have big ambitious goals or you have things that you want to do, you'll hear, you'll hear well-intentioned people, well-intentioned people uh, putting governors on you, putting limits on you, arguing for your limitations, right? Saying, hey, I'm going to help you out. What if I said, you know what, you're, you're awesome. Well, you're awesome. Mary, you're real great. And you shouldn't have to walk up this big, huge hill. There's a, we, 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 we got to go up this huge hill. It's 200 yards and it's at an incline. Um, I'm going to get this wheelchair and I want you to hit, uh, sit in the wheelchair and I'm going to run you up that hill every day, right? So you're like, oh, John's such a nice guy. And I'm running you up this hill. A couple of years go by running up this hill, right? And everybody else is, is, is walking up that hill, sweating, legs hurting. Megan's over there like, man, come on, man, this is great. What, what's going to happen to Mary's legs? What's going to happen to her muscles, right? They're going to atrophy over time. They're going to atrophy. Then, and then if, if she's like, oh, I want more out of life. I want to get up the hill faster or whatever. I want to do this. She's going to get out and she's going to legitimately struggle. Then may even fall into the trap of arguing for her limitations. If you argue for your limitations, you get to keep them. I'll say that one more time. If you argue for your limitations, you get to keep them. So if we don't want to argue for our limitations, well, that's, that's one thing. But also we have to be mindful of well-intentioned people, well-intentioned statements and comments. Like, hey, oh, it's okay. You're probably going to stutter for the rest of your life. It's all right. Like, hey, businesses don't, you know, businesses don't technically work out and this and any other. What did some early on folks tell you about selling power? You know what I mean? In the early, early, early days, and you're this crazy guy saying, I'm going to do this. What was, what was the reaction that you got early on from some folks? It's never going to work. Nobody's going to buy it. Nobody's going to be interested in that. And good salespeople are born, not made. <laughs> and, 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 it wasn't, and, it wasn't, and it necessarily wasn't haters saying that either, right? It's oh, not like... No, no. And that's the thing that, um, you know, uh, we, we are all fighting our own ignorance of what the possibilities are. And I think that uh, your, your story about, you know, we, we, we're coming full circle. You, you started out with uh, defining relationship as energy, whereas, um, you know, Uma de uh, defined relationships as uh, feeling loved. And, um, and, uh, Jerome um, is says it's vital to business, um, and and I want to want to bring it back to how can we change uh, if we need to, uh, and 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 let go of the old ways of believing. So um, I want to want to continue to share my screen because there there is a a way to think about this. Um, can you see my screen now? Mm -hmm. All right. So we, we talked about the recent relationship challenge that, uh, you know, everybody probably has something different here. But um, I want you to think about consciously, how do you feel about your relationships in terms of great, average, and poor, uh, about your boss, your co-workers, uh, relationships with your customers and your friends? So just make a check mark and, um, you know, green is great, yellow is average, red is poor. And then you go and say, what do, what do I want to improve? Uh, let's say you, you have conflicts with the boss because the boss is too strict or you have uh, c uh, conflicts with customers because they don't do what they're promised to do or with your friends and, uh, and then you go back to the implanted mindset. And, and um, John said it earlier, you know, the relationship you have with yourself is the blueprint for the relationships 
you have with other people. And you want to think about what was my relationship with my mother, with my father, with my caretakers, with my siblings. And, uh, you know, we heard uh, earlier that, uh, you know, from uh, uh, Dion, the relationships with uh, parents were conflicted because they uh, implanted in her mindset the idea that uh, she needs to be better and there are consequences if she doesn't do what they're saying and she gets um, uh, the paddle or she gets the, 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 a belt or something and she gets punished. So the implanted mindset needs to be replanted. And what, what we need to do is uh, examine those self-limiting beliefs that we have about the relationships that translate into, I lack confidence, I don't know how I fit in, I'm not lovable, like Uma wants to feel loved. And, and, and he, in his upbringing, um, moving from Pakistan to, to England as a seven, seven-year-old, uh, realizing that uh, you know, parents don't act lovingly anymore to each other because one embraces the new culture and the other one doesn't. Um, or um, feeling I'm boring, or I'm not smart enough, or I'm, I'm a stutterer, and um, I want to break through, and I can break through because we all have the capacity to change. Um, and, and then you want to set relationship goals. Here's where you are, here's where you want to be, and here's where top performers are. And a lot of people just think about where they want to be, but you want to think about where you could be if there were no limits. And, and you want to implant new beliefs. So the question is, how can we do that? And one answer is role models, you know, like Oprah. Uh, she says, don't settle for a relationship that won't let you be yourself. Um, and we learn from a lot, of, and, and, and again, that's the imprinted mindset. It's not the implanted mindset. Um, and I want to share a quick video. I've done this interview with Keith Crack. At the time, he was the chairman of DocuSign. Now he's the Under Secretary of State, and uh, he talks about a very pivotal relationship that he has created with John Chambers. Let me let me play. It's about friendships. It's not not how many LinkedIn uh, people you, you're networked to. Because at the end of the day, uh, business is done based on a trusted relationship. What was funny is, you know, I was probably in my late 30s, early 40s, you know, running the rebuild, the benchmark guys go, and crap, you should have a mentor. And I go like, who? And I go like, John James. like, I don't know if he'd ever talk to me. And, and ironically, a week later, I get a call. Keith? This is John Chambers. Uh, we just got selected to speak to the board of Telefonica in Madrid, Spain. Would you like to fly there with me? And that's how we, that's how we met. We had an amazing uh, flight over to Europe, and that was the day that Cisco became the number one market capitalization company in the world. And then after the flight, he goes, you know what? Let's get together once a month for breakfast. And so I, would, I did that every year for four or five years. And I remember the first time coming in, he goes, Keith, you can ask me anything, anything you want at all, you know, because the things that you can't ask the board, your executive staff, you know, your wife maybe doesn't understand. And I did. I asked him everything under the sun. And here's the interesting thing that um, he was... Um He said that John Chambers, in one of the meetings, asked him, Keith, you're probably wondering, why am I doing this? And I'm doing this for nothing. And, uh, and Keith said, yeah, I'm very interested. And he says, well, when I was your age, in your situation, I had the, the founder, one of the co-founders of uh, HP, do that to me and he made me promise to pass on the gift 
and so I'm doing it for you. So I think it's a it's a wonderful um, idea that I encourage everybody to uh, to think about. Uh, you know, find find a mentor, find somebody that you look up to, somebody that embodies the qualities that you wish you had but you don't have yet. So, John, um, share a, a mentor story with us. Oh gosh, I've got a bunch of a uh, <clears throat> bunch of different mentor stories. Um, well, let's see. What's a uh, what's an embarrassing? Uh, okay, so I remember. Uh, I remember, you know, going to uh, going to you know through the entrepreneurship scene, and uh, you know, going to the entrepreneurship scene and. I was getting introductions to a lot of folks, a lot of different folks. And, and I really wanted to get into the number one startup accelerator in the world, which was Techstars, right? It's less than 1% acceptance rate, yada, yada. And you got to get in and do all this stuff. And, um, you know, I was, I was uh, running around and doing the entrepreneur thing, pitching and, 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 and doing all that stuff. And, but I wasn't, uh, I wasn't raising any money. I uh, wasn't raising any money. I, I was, you know, I was running around doing all this stuff and I just wasn't getting, in, I wasn't getting there. And uh, I picked this story because it's probably one of the most um, uh, humbling uh, stories or bare embarrassing stories. So I, so I'm like, dude, I, I'm super sharp. I'm going to these meetings, super sharp, suit tie. I got all my presentation down. <clears throat> I'm not ready. I got all these things ready. You couldn't tell me anything. I had all the projections, you name it and all this stuff. And so I, I pitched one of these investors and uh, he says, wow, because, uh, hey, how's fundraising going? And I've been pretty frustrated. And so I decided, I decided to, uh, to play the, the, the race card. I was like, okay, let me try this out here. I was like, hey. So that's what I said. I go, oh, well, as you know, you know it's, uh, the numbers are pretty clear. It's, it's hard for people like me to, to raise capital for, the, for our companies and everything. But, you know, uh, with your investment, you know, that'll, that'll really go a long way. And uh, he, he said to me, you know, I got to let you know, I absolutely loved your presentation. I loved it. But I refused to invest in your company. I said, oh, well, why? He says, well, there are so many different factors that go into whether or not an investor will invest in a company and you choose to harp on the one thing you can't control. You know what? The last person that, that pitched me it was their 400th pitch, their 400th investor that they had pitched. I'm convinced that they'll do whatever it takes to, to make it. You? Not so sure. And I was like, ooh, ouch. <laughs> that was, I mean, talk about just a punch in the gut. Uh, and so uh, after I was able to gather my, gather what was left of any ego I had assembled, I, uh, I, you know, I asked him to, I want to talk, you know, I would like to you know, be mentored. And he said, I thought you'd never ask. And so he sat me down and he said, you know, for starters, let me give you the, and he gave me this whole scoop about, about entrepreneurship and, and, and echoed something that I'd later heard from David Cohen, which is being a, being an entrepreneur is continually testing your hypotheses. Right. And so you've got to, you've got to have this theory and you've got to test these theories and do all these things. And uh, he said, uh, he said, partly too, he said, problem with your pitch, a problem with your pitch is uh you ever see how these guys from Silicon Valley, they walk in with like shorts and a t-shirt, like disheveled and walk out with a million bucks. I was like, I know. And that's why I'm thinking like, what's, what's the deal? I'm in a suit and tie off. <laughs> and he goes, here's the difference. You recognize, you don't recognize what they already know. And what they already know is your business model is going to be wrong. There's not one investor that invests in something that was super duper successful and the business model was exactly the way they thought it was. It's going to be wrong. So I'm coming in there being Mr. Perfect. <laughs> As you can see, by month nine, we're going to be rich. I mean, it's like I had all the answers. And they knew that that was, that was bull. And so the moment I changed my perspective, took full responsibility for the outcomes in my life, then all of a sudden, everything just transformed and changed. So that was a great, uh, great, great mentor. A long, you know, it's a long list of mentors, but that was, that was a really, really fantastic one because everything changed. Raised millions of dollars for my startup, got into the number one startup accelerator in the world, you know, then got into speaking and coaching and, you know, none of that would have happened if I held on to those other things. So sometimes it takes a, 
person like that to rattle your cage a little bit. Great story. Thank you. I want, I want to continue and, and, and share my screen. And, uh, and I want to talk about how do we now change the beliefs So we talked about the relationship models. So how do you transform the belief? Let's say, here's the sticker. He'll never talk to me, or he'll never be a mentor, or she'll never say yes to me. So how do you transform from the old belief that's negative to the new belief that's positive? I'm a believer in taking the risk of rejection. So. Who wants to explain how beliefs get transformed? You want to take a crack at that, John? There are three types of beliefs. Limiting beliefs, hollow beliefs, and conditional beliefs. And in my experience, people who are uh, business-minded, entrepreneurial folks, uh, they do really well with conditional beliefs. And the conditional belief is, if I do what's required, it will happen, whatever it is. That's the belief. Believe that if you do what's required, then it will happen. You just have to find out what's required. It's been transformative for a lot of folks. So the actual, the actual belief piece also is an exercise in discipline. Why? Because the brain prefers quantity first. It doesn't say, well, that's a quality statement. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna hit that home. Your brain doesn't do that. Your brain favors quantity. So what is it hearing over and over and over again? What are the things that it's, that it's hearing? So it's a, it's, a, it's a two pronged approach. One, having that conditional belief that you can socialize, right? If I do what's required, then it will happen. Whatever that thing is, this is the thing that'll happen if I do what's required. And two, start to make these firm statements. Some say affirmations, but these are more these, these firm statements where you are literally projecting what it is that you do, whether it's I exercise or I do this, or I, you know, I'm, I'm consistent with this. You start to say that you start to say it, right? Hear it, read it, say it every single day. People, oh, it's foofy stuff. It's not, it's science. Your brain will start to go, well, sh I gotta make sure I gotta figure that. I gotta find a way to make that true. That's what your brain does. It's your brain's job. Right? Your basal ganglia, that's you know, the, the, the whole point is to create habits, is to create shortcuts, to conserve energy. Brain's got a lot of things going on, so they're just trying to be efficient. That is literally all they do. So you can hack that right, by doing that. So all of a sudden, it's, it happens negatively too. If you keep hearing that you're worthless or you keep hearing that you can't or you keep hearing your limit is this, your limit is this, your limit is this, you don't do it. Everybody knows the story about the time the six-minute mile was broke and then the five-minute mile was broke and nobody thought you could do it. It's nobody thought that you could do that. All of a sudden it opens up possibilities. So the transformation of a belief also is to, is to understand and have a conversation with the actual limiting belief that you have. So we did an exercise and I've been doing this work for, uh, for quite a while. And I thought to myself, I don't really have any, belief in, any limiting beliefs. And I did this exercise uh, with a young woman who, who got, who had us go real, real deep to go find those limiting beliefs. And, and we actually wrote them down on a piece of paper and burned them. But, but the limiting belief that needed to be transformed, I found two. I found two limiting beliefs. One limiting belief was that, that if, I, if I spoke my mind, and right, if I truly spoke my mind, then it would be detrimental to my family and my future. Right, with, the, with today's landscape and stuff like that. If I, just, if I truly just spoke my mind, it would be detrimental to to, to my future, to my financial future, to my family future, to, to everything. And the other limiting belief was that one day my stutter would return with a vengeance and ruin everything I'd worked for for the past 20 years, 25 years. Those were, those were my two. So then you had, now you have to do is replace those and it's work, but you have to start saying those things. So you don't, you don't ignore that limiting belief, you acknowledge that you had it, you thank it for you know, the, the purpose that served in your life. Well, I appreciate you, but we're gonna go with this one now, right? We're gonna go with this one now. So I had to replace those. 
I said, you know, me, me speaking my mind and speaking true will, will help to understand and open up new opportunities for me. Speaking my mind and being specific about what I feel and what I think will open up new opportunities for me. That's my new belief. And so I've been saying that 76 days, 76 days in a row. So it's a battle every day. I'm just going to win. I'm just going to win. I'm going to win today. I won this morning. I'll win tomorrow morning and the next morning and the next morning. So when I have more opportunities to speak my mind, I do so because that's the thing. And then the second one is if my stutter were to ever return, I know exactly how to beat it. And this time I'll do so publicly. And I say that over and over and over again. So this whole belief thing, I mean, we, we were working really hard about that. Everybody's got this negative voice in their head, this negative self-talk. It ranges from a little bit of self-doubt to downright disrespect. Now, only you know exactly what level there is. I remember years ago, my dad, I was, I was explaining my, my negative self-talk, and my dad looks at me and says, yeah, NAU. Well, <laughs> who the hell is it? If it ain't me, who, <laughs> who the hell is it, right? And so I gave it a persona. I gave my negative self-talk a persona. And I've shared it with thousands of people, and I'll share it with you too. You're more than welcome to use it if you want to give your negative self-talk a persona. It ain't you. It ain't it starts, going anywhere. It starts with a C. Z. Zertog. So right. I named my negative self-talk Zertog. Zertog is an alien from the planet Zertog. He's got really long arms. He loves basketball. And he's an asshole. That's, that's him. That's him. He's always there. He's always there. He's here to say stuff, you know? And so you listen to him rarely. Maybe if I'm going to go in a swamp in, in the middle of New Orleans or something, like they're talking about, I say, hey, man, you know, I don't know about that. Man, I might listen to him then. But as far as business and stuff like that, I'm not, hey, man, I, I hear you. I know you're a little scared and everything like that, but we're going to do this anyways. We're going to push through. It's okay. It'll be all right. So anyways, yeah, change that relationship. Conditional beliefs. Doesn't sound sexy, but it will transform your life. Conditional beliefs beliefs. If I do what's required, then it will happen. So then you're changing your focus and you're, you're changing your focus to say, now I just have to find out what's required. Like what is required? Very tactical. So when, when it comes to, um, uh, if I speak my mind, um, it will be detrimental to my future. Um, who will be your role model? Uh, because when, when it came to stuttering, uh, you were singing and you were mimicking a news anchor. So who is your positive role model for, um, for speaking your mind? Mm, I don't really, I don't really have like, I don't really have like idols to role models to an extent, but there are, there are, there are many examples, right? Uh, so there's a man by the name of John Hope Bryant, who, uh, who served as the financial advisor to three sitting presidents, right? both Democrat and Republican and, and um, has a company and talks about financial literacy uh, sometimes to the detriment of his own popularity on social media. Um, you know, you know, our, our, you know, our current president is not afraid to also tweet and say whatever the heck he wants. Right. You've got people online. You've got people online that um, have had some really hard conversations when it comes to some topics that we're talking about now. And it's around self accountability. A lot of times that's a tough conversation to have. It's a tough it's a tough thing to sell. The easier thing to sell is the Cobra effect, right? It's like, no, no, we got you. We're going to take care of you. Sit in this wheelchair. We're going to push you up. You're less than. We are going to help you. You're, you're, you're oppressed. We're going to help you. So my unpopular view is like, the, the hell I am. It's wild. Somebody was telling me, uh, because, you're, because you're black, you have a, uh, I forget the stat, but it's like something crazy, like a 60% chance of going to prison. I'm like, that's the most asinine thing I've ever heard. Because of me, I live in the woodlands. Like we, I live in suburbia, suburbia. Okay, we got. I mean, it's the whole, the whole deal. I've been pulled over three times in the last three years. I deserved three tickets. I have zero tickets. I'm every bit of a big black, you big scary black man, and I have three tickets. I have zero tickets. Why? Let's talk about energy for a second, right? But let's break this stat down. So, if somebody can look at me, and how how crazy is that, by the way? And if look, if I said this publicly. Oh yeah, the heat's gonna come. Well, I've been preparing myself for this, but you say it publicly, and all of a sudden, if I was a white dude, I would be, I would be racist. I'm a black dude, it's, it's, you know, it's other names. But at the end of the day, it's like, wait. So what I did is I sent for the data. I said, hold on, let's dig a little deeper. I found two things out that nobody talks about. Thing number one is something that you've probably never heard, but as soon as I say it, you're gonna recognize. I mean, you're gonna understand exactly what it means. 
pre-incarceration income. <sighs> Never heard that before, have you? But, but it makes sense, pre-incarceration income. How much money you made before you went to prison? You know the difference between a white man and a black man going to prison? Pre-incarceration income, $400 a year. It's damn near identical, 19.6, 19.2. That's a strong indicator. Another strong indicator that I discovered, 90% of men, all men, not black, not white, all men, 90%, 90% of those people in prison, no father figure. That's a strong indicator. Makes a whole lot more sense. It's not as convenient. It's not as politically convenient, but it makes a whole lot more sense. And it's something we can actually do to actually have some change. Financial literacy and focus on the family and the nuclear family, all of that. Make sure you have big, big brother programs where you need to have those and mentorship programs. Those are like real things we can do. But that was the thing. Like, wait, time out. Now we get into today's time where all white people in, in, in America have to like post these different hashtags and post black boxes to prove that they're not racist. What is this about? This whole privilege thing where all of a sudden, and I've talked, every white person I've had a conversation with, I'm like, they're like, oh, you know, I want to check my privilege. I'm like, privilege over who? Who you got privilege over? Tell me something I can't do that you can do. I'll wait. How many times you've been pulled over and got out of a ticket? I got out of three and I'm not pretty and I'm not, you know, what's up? What's up? What you got? <laughs> it wasn't flattery. You know what I'm saying? It's not, like, you know what I mean? It's like, come on, like, give me the, give me the scoop. Tell me, tell me. Here's the crazy part. You know what we said earlier, if you argue for your limitations, if you argue, why would you argue for mine? That's wild. That's crazy to me. This is, this is the unpopular view that, that, you know, it's like, but it, why is it unpopular? So I look at this and I say, okay, you, you, you know, you say this and, and you know what somebody said, and it was a, young, a, a woman who, again, well-intentioned, well-intentioned, just like the government in New Delhi, well-intentioned. But she said, no, you know what? I want to give a voice to the voiceless. And I said, who are you calling voiceless? She just. So when, when somebody pulls you over, what, how do you respond? So one time I had my kids, I had all three of my kids in the car. Uh, they were asking so many questions and uh, I was answering the questions right there. You know, like, Hey, what's going on? Are you, you know, what'd you do? Are you going to go to jail? What's happening? You know, what's this? What's this? What's he doing? What's he doing? And I'm just answering the questions. Daddy was speeding. That's why he got pulled over. You know, what's it? Oh, you know, and I'm teaching them as the kids are asking questions, but what, what do I do? It's, it's pretty simple, right? I pull over, I turn the car off. I take my keys and put it on the dash. I put my hands on the steering wheel. I smile, you know, so when I work out, I have a, a bad habit of frowning and I look like I looked in the mirror one time at myself. I'm like, damn, dude, like you got to <laughs> you look. But, you know, so I smile. Right. He doesn't know me. He has no he has no idea who I am. I want to let him know a few things off the bat. One, I don't want any problems. Two, I'm going to cooperate and communicate. Three, like, you know, I'm a respectable guy, presentable, all that good stuff. Like, let's do this. If I made a mistake, I'll own up to it. If I'm going to get a ticket, it's not the end of the world. Right. And even if I think you're doing wrong, which I've had that encounter as well, I'm not going to argue with you. Not, on the, not in the street. If I got a problem, I'm going to take it up in, in other ways, in the proper ways. So I get pulled over. My kids are right there in the car, and license and registration. And I, and I told them, hey, my license and registration is in the glove compartment. It's kind of messy because, you know, I just be throwing shit in there. So when I, when I open it, I'm going to give it a second and let some things shuffle around, and then I'll grab it. Is that okay? Wonderful. Cool. I'm about to, and I was giving them the play-by-play. To the point where he said, man, chill. Like he, at this point, he's cool. He's like, man, chill, you're good. You know, like he wanted me to relax, man, relax, you know, kind of thing, right? The kids were asking these questions. Why are you doing this? And I explained. And my other kid, why'd you take your keys and put it on the dash? I said, well, because this officer, you know, the officer's right there. The kid's asking this. I'm like, oh, the officer has no clue. Sometimes people might want to try to pull a fast one, maybe drive or this and that. Why do you have your hands on the steering wheel and you have your fingers out like this? I said, well, because that police officer has no idea no idea if I have a gun or if I'm going to do something bad. Why would you do something bad? You know, it's like, well, you know, some, sometimes people do. And there's a lot of different reasons. It's complicated. But let me get this ticket. Just, just chill out for a second. Uh, but I didn't get a ticket. I got a warning. What did he want to show? So now we've got these people wanting to learn or whatever. What did he want to show? What, what story does he want to tell? It's not always the case. It's not always the case at all. But, uh, but it, you know, at the end of the day, I want to stress to everyone, and this doesn't matter how, what you look like or whatever the case may be, there's a difference, very, very important difference between fault and responsibility. It's the case of the pedestrian. You guys heard that one? A man's walking down the street, minding his own business, law-abiding citizen, pedestrian, walking down the street. 
a young woman falls asleep at the wheel, jumps the curb and runs the man over. They get to the hospital. The doctor says, sir, there is not any bit of surgery. There's no surgery that's gonna put you back to normal where you were before this accident. It doesn't exist, can't do it. The only thing that's gonna help you is a couple of years of gruesome PT, physical therapy, that's it. Pedestrian says, that's not fair. I did not do anything wrong. That's not fair. Like, she should have to make this right. She's the one who jumped and broke the law, jumped the curb, this, that, that. I didn't do that stuff. Now, time out. Is he right? He's right. But does it matter? But it's still his, resp whose responsibility is it to pick himself up and dust himself off and move himself forward? It's his. And it's, again, unpopular view. It's not sexy to talk about this stuff. It's not. Like, oh, great, here we go. Is the guy talking about responsibility? But it's true. The only way for you to have the best life that you want to have is to take full responsibility for the outcomes. Because then you start to ask yourself powerful questions. Instead of, and I did a whole TED talk on this, right? TED changed the title. I did a whole TED talk on this exact, exact very thing. It's now titled, Everyone Has Hardships. But the original title was, Why the Race Card Has Expired. And it's an empowering talk. It's not, it's, and I see a couple faces like, ooh, I'm curious. Yeah, be curious, watch that. I'm gonna make a point. I'm gonna make something universally applicable and I'm gonna make you laugh. Those are my three promises. You will laugh, you will get the point and you will see that it's universally applicable. Whether you're a woman or you're disabled or you're this or you're that, whatever box you wanna check, it is, it is universally applicable. Four steps. Sean. I want to I want to hear um, what do you think about adversity versus your ability to handle adversity? Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, when when I go back to your stutter story, um, you uh, you were pretty resourceful. Um, you said I can sing, and not stutter. Uh, you said I can mimic the news anchor. I can visualize. And uh, I read books and I imagine myself on stage. So you discovered very early at uh, age 10 that you have resources where you can harness your energy and pull through the adversity. And then, uh, you know, occasionally you may have a twinge where you may worry that your stutter is going to come back, but then you fall back on your resources, which is I can continue with my affirmation. And, uh, and I use my energy to push through any adversity. Yeah. Is that a yeah. fair assessment? That's a very fair assessment. Right. Yeah. So, so let, me, let me hitchhike on that idea and then, then come back. Uh, I want to uh, um, make that point and, and illustrate uh, that there is a... Um, a methodology that anybody can use. Um, my idea is that you can't plant seeds in a garden that's overgrown with weeds. And by weeds, I mean negative thoughts. And, um, you know, well, the TED talk that you have about um, adversity uh, is so intriguing because uh, we have a, a belief system that sometimes uh, makes us turn into a proponent of the adversity and make it bigger and stand in the way. And uh, we can uh, weed that garden and plant new seeds. And there's a belief transformation journey. And it begins, let's say, you say, I'm not good enough, very generic, self-limiting belief. You begin with mindfulness and, um, you know, John, you, you, have, uh, you have a wonderful facility to say, um, I am sort of assuming a superior outsider position and analyze the situation and, and treat a thought as if it were an object from a foreign planet. Uh, it's, it's not mine, it came from somewhere. So you become mindful and you view your thoughts as guests uh, in a guest house that you own. And as the owner of the guest house, you know that thoughts come and go um, and you don't fight with them. And um, uh, John also said something that um, I, I took some notes as, as he was speaking, 
that um, you you don't ignore that difficulty. You accept it. So you accept those thoughts in your in in your in your mind, and and as if you were sitting there and offering the the guest that comes to your house a seat on the couch uh, opposite, and and then have a dialogue and uh, be sort of detached, and don't fight the guest, uh, don't show him the door, don't and 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 be confident in the knowledge that the guest ultimately will leave. The second step is articulate your old beliefs. Uh, the old belief is, uh, you know, uh, let's say, uh, I, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not lovable, and and therefore I need more love from other people. I need more acceptance from from other people. Um, and then you go back to uh, analyzing where does this belief come from? Who implanted that? And maybe it's for for Uma. Uh, parents moving away from Pakistan, moving to London, um, and, um, and starting to fight, and then feeling neglected, not loved, because parents were too busy with themselves. Um, or uh, in the case of Jerome, uh, you, you can think about where does that belief originate? The next is, what are the consequences of not changing? So if you continue to lead your life based on the belief that you're not good enough, uh, then you're not going to have a rich and fulfilling life. And the next question would be, what would be a better way to think about it? And that's where uh, John's resourcefulness uh, says, well, there is a better way. I, uh, the, the, the expert says that I may start it for a lifetime, but I say, there's a better way to think about it. I can work on this and I can discover ways inside of me. And that's what Tony Robbins said once that everything we need to succeed is within us now. And we want to give ourselves a chance to discover that. And then think about what are the advantages of a new belief of letting go of not good enough. What is the advantage that you are enough, you are good enough, and you are lovable, you are capable, you have the ability to overcome any challenge. And then there's another step that somebody once taught me, which is to forgive yourself for believing what other people implanted in your mind. That's not genuinely yours. And say, I forgive myself for believing that it was not good enough. And then embrace that new belief, which is whatever you want to be, that you're a very special uh, person. So that belief transformation is, there's a process to it. And uh, some people do it on their own and some people need to go through it step by step. Um, my friend, Bill McDermott, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, you know, he's a believer about relationships that if you uh, treat people with dignity and respect, they give it right back to you. So when he goes uh, in a building and sees somebody cleaning the floor, he may say, thank you for cleaning the floor. Um, he, is, um, he is using empathy um, and he's recognizing uh, people, people's needs for dignity and he respects them. Um, and Six Eagler said it wonderfully, where he says, you can get anything in life you want, providing you help enough other people get what they want. So I want to spend, uh, let's see, we're, we're almost uh, out of time, but I want all of you to uh, write down three beliefs about relationships on a personal level and on a business level. So um, I want you to create your own stickers of what you aspire to, so you can have more fulfilling relationships. And uh, let's take two minutes and uh, take a pen and paper and uh, write down three beliefs about your personal relationships and three beliefs about your business relationships where you want to be. All right, who wants to go first? Chip of my life must meet the following criteria. One, it must result in a net improvement in my 
in my life, either directly or indirectly. Two, it must result in a net improvement in their life, either directly or indirectly. And three, it must be affordable. I'm talking about time and energy. That's it. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Dion? Yeah, I have the belief of leaving the world and people better than I found them, right? So just being that army of one to pass along goodwill in this world. Um, and the ability to alternate between being a lover and a fighter and a doer and a, I'm happy to chill on the couch, right? <laughs> so I think that chameleon-like component. Uh, Jerome, thank you. The things I want to put into the relationship are now I want people to see me as someone that's dependable, uh, trustworthy, uh, always willing to assist, help in any way that I can, and, um, and let them know that I am professional and, and, and can help them achieve whatever success they're looking to achieve. That's awesome. Mike, you want to chime in? Sure. <clears throat> um, on the personal side, I put... Uh, insightful, inspirational, and real. So um, a lot of those things come down to trust and listening, of course, and being there for a person. But um, as well, I think that uh, being my best self and, and continuing just to be a good friend and, um, you know, holding things true. You know, I think that on the business side, it translates more to keeping integrity in the room. But on the friendlier side, it's more of just uh, being present. Awesome. Mary? Hi, mine are pretty similar for both. Um, I, I value relationships um, in, in which trust is present and where there is that mutual respect and, and kindness. That's awesome. Megan? Yeah, mine are, mine are similar. Um, on my, I have on the business side, emphasize that I'm human in a sense of how I make decisions and relate to others. Um, and similarly uh, on the personal side, I have um, someone you can count on um, and someone who's a loving friend. So just someone who's there mostly. Beautiful. Thank you, Mark. Uh, yeah, just be, just be present on the personal side, dependable. Uh, someone they can call on, I can talk to, help them work things out. And then on the business side, uh, dependable, uh, somebody I can count on, you know, help get things done, uh, and that's going to produce. Thank you. Uma? Just share one since we're out of time. Uh, I'm always learning. Awesome. Yes, we are out of time, and I will send you um, uh, some of the um, – worksheets so you can uh, work on the other five uh, core belief systems, especially the one that deals with physical fitness. Um, so I recorded this today and I will send you an email with all the links so you can see all the recordings. I also will send you a PDF of the workbook and I send you a worksheet for the belief transformation and I see you next week. <laughs>